We've got an intro, ladies, gentlemen, and NBs. And I'm so glad they kept the Game of Thrones theme song because, you know, it's so iconic and it gives me goosebumps from a former time of glory. <sighs> Although named heir to the Iron Throne, Rhaenyra does not get a seat at the table beside her father, nor do we get any sign that she might be involved in matters of the realm as other heirs to the throne had been. She keeps on filling cups for the lords. Not much has changed for her, indeed we know later on that father and daughter have barely spoken to each other after the funeral of Aima in Balon. When she gives an opinion about the matter discussed, there's silence in the room as every lord is stunned by the mere suggestion. More than her father, Rhaenyra sees the need for action concerning the Stepstones supporting Lord Valerian. To no one's surprise, she's shut down. This conflict is constantly brought up as the episode moves forward. When Rhaenys approaches Rhaenyra, she, as the queen who never was, tries to warn her of the way the world works, claiming that men would rather put the realm to the torch than see a woman sit the Iron Throne. Despite Otto's efforts to wondermine Princess Rhaenyra, she proves him and all the lords wrong. Even after being shut down for suggesting to send dragon riders to the Stepstones, she shines in her punishment choosing Sir Kristen Cole, the only knight with combat experience, to join the Kingsguard. Perhaps hurt by her uncle's actions in addition to grief, Rhaenyra flies Cyrax to Dragonstone, further undermining Otto Hightower, who wouldn't have accomplished anything threatened by Caraxes like she said. Damon also has a soft spot for Rhaenyra, it's obvious at this point, so he gives in easily and gives back the egg. As heir, Rhaenyra found a confidence she didn't have in the first episode showing her rebellious heart instead of being content with what she has. Although Rhaenyra proves her worth in a short time, the lords and the maester want the king to remarry. Nonetheless, Viserys does mention to his daughter that even though he might marry, he has no intention to name another heir. Throughout the episode, the characters are led to believe Viserys will marry Lena Valerian, even Rhaenyra. It is indeed a marriage that would mend the rift between the Valerian and Targaryen, securing the succession matter even further. Otto's manipulation leads the king to reject this marriage, as it has been heavily hinted from the end of the last episode who the king will marry. On the other side of the high tower coin, it doesn't seem that Alicent is too happy with the match. She's a rule follower, an obedient daughter, but that is also something that stresses her based on a habit of tearing out the skin around her nails. Princess Rhaenyra has more power besides the king, but Alicent is the one who seizes it for herself even if she's not looking for it actively. Announcing Alicent as the new queen creates a rift between the friends, a fantastic way to expand upon their relationship. Beyond the drama of politics, Alicent and Rhaenyra only had each other, being both teenagers, misunderstood by her parents, and with dead mothers. Alicent even spent the whole episode trying to bring Viserys and Rhaenyra together after the loss in their family serving as a discreet pigeon carrier to mend their wounds. The dialogue between Viserys and Rhaenyra at the dinner scene was awkward, illustrating the rift between them. And the cricket in the back didn't help, I guess. The choice Alicent had to make in this episode was to be 
a good daughter or to be a good friend. I can't fathom that she wasn't sad about Rhaenyra's reaction. The episode starts with setting up a conflict that was briefly mentioned by Corlys in the first episode, introducing a new character called the Crab Feeder. This doesn't get lost as the episode moves forward, tying into changing loyalties and Daemon's rogueness. It will also be the basis for Corlys's and Daemon's relationship as they both mean to fight for their places in the world. I've always thought of you and I as having been made from the same cloth. We've been passed over too often. As second sons, they may find a common ground to prevail with each other's help. Uniting against the crab feeder will benefit them both, as Corliss said. Waiting in the stepstones is a chance to prove your worth to any who might yet doubt it. That last shot of Damon looking back, then cut to the crab feeder, it's heavy foreshadowing of how Damon will prevail in that fight. Props to the editor for that one. I love the attention to detail. Damon's and Corliss's alliance is the culmination of Viserys's passiveness. It was never my brother's strongest trait being king. In the first episode, Damon also mentions this weakness of Viserys's when claims to see Hoto Eye Tower for what he is, that he doesn't protect Viserys, but Damon does. When he asks from what, Damon answers, yourself. Damon isn't wrong, he truly just wants to be beside his brother, seeing him as a weak king who wants to please everybody. We've been seeing even the Iron Throne cut him in different places each episode, and I imagine this will be his downfall. It is said that the Iron Throne cuts those who are not fit for it. Mago the Cruel was found impaled by it even. Daenerys' father had many cuts from sitting on it too. This can be seen as a plain, simple metaphor, as Viserys is hurting the realm each time he makes a significant action, like banishing Daemon from court or marrying Alicent. These actions, led by the heart rather than the mind, hurt the realm, and especially his own family. For the only thing that could tear down the House of the Dragon was itself. The House of the Dragon is starting to solidify that the core conflict is centered around the Targaryens, being more of a family drama with people who happen to have dragons. It's not necessarily a political chessboard like Game of Thrones. Bringing a fresh element by exploring what it means to be a woman in a man's world. So I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time. Bye.